All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is uh, Todd Browse. I'm your host for the evening. I'm here with Susan Schultz and Ashley Wilson, and we would like to welcome everyone to HPAP Startups. It's my honor to introduce tonight's speakers, two of my heroes. Kelly Kimball is an HBS executive fellow, entrepreneur, political strategist, and insanely sought after lecturer. He's pioneered a number of business enterprises, taking them from startups to multi-million dollar corporations. And, and I love to tease him that in his spare time, he enjoys programming in Python in our studio. And also I'd like to introduce our guest of honor, Kareem Lakani. Now, Kareem's bio is just simply too long to go through, so I'll eventually paste it in the Zoom chat, but I can tell you that he is the Indiana Jones of competing in the age of AI. His lectures are so riveting that even the algorithms stop and listen to him speak. And his research is so groundbreaking and cutting edge that in the future, our super intelligent AI overlords will have to ask Kareem how to use ChatGPT. Now, without further ado, my heroes, Kelly Kimbo and Kareem Lakani. Kareem, Thanks, you want to start folks. this? Go, Kareem. I'll be overstay stuff. No, Kelly, you go, man. It's your show. <laughs> but <laughs> Kareem and I obviously have not, uh, you know, uh, coordinated this at all. Um, let me let me just give you the origin story, I guess. We can start with that. Um, this was a uh, this started off as a, uh, a just a wild sort of uh, uh, question, and and I happen to have uh, if I could share this. This was the moment that. Uh, that somebody captured where I was on the bus with uh, with uh, Gavin, and I said, you know, you really need to start telling this story, and I've got the perfect place for you. You know, can we go to Harvard and and do this? Um, and uh, shockingly, he said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and uh, so this started us down this path. Um, at first, it was going to be live uh, in a Zoom room like this, and then we could not nail him down for any, any particular time because he is the governor of the fifth largest economy in the world, and he is you know, subject to having to run off at a moment's notice. Um, so, and then Kareem hijacked the entire conversation. We were, we were uh, having a drink uh, and I said, hey, Kareem, I got this thing, you know, you want to do the fireside chat. And he agreed to it. And then Jen, who I hope is on here somewhere, she actually came in and said, we're, we're stealing this from you. It's now a decubed event. And uh, it, it really kicked in and, it, and thank God it did. When you guys see this, uh, uh, this, this, this give and take, this, this uh, discussion, you'll realize why I'm so grateful that I didn't do it, um, that Kareem did it in, in my place. So that's that's kind of how we got here. And, uh, the, you know, the, the crew packed up all the cameras and, uh, and the audio, and we went on a one-week road trip together that started with the governor and ended up with Derek Ali down at Death Row Records, uh, which was a bizarre week, but uh, that's for another story. But Kareem. What's, what's your rap name? Uh, the <laughs> uh, it's, Oh, God. It's a mailbox money is what I was given. So... Uh, uh, yeah. if, but if anybody calls me that, you're dead to me. Yes. So first of all, uh, thanks to Todd and to Susan and to Ashley for organizing this uh, for us. Uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm going through the throes of uh, uh, HBAP uh, 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 retrieval syndrome. Like I've been, you know, as you know, I stepped down as chair, and I'm letting you know Fang run the show from the HBS side and it's sort of, you know, weird to be in that position, but what's nice is to come back to you guys and reconnect uh, in this way. Uh, what I'm most proud about is that the fact that, you know, as we started the program, uh, you know, we've, we graduated a thousand people uh, uh, as HVAC workers in five years time. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. And also very grateful to first uh, to uh, all of you that took the program, of course, that they're all, you are here and all of you that finished and then, uh, it's also are staying engaged with the community. As you, as you recall, we were uh, we had talked about this being um, uh, the most important thing about HPAP was the community. And I'm grateful for these types of events to keep the community going uh, into what it is today. So, so thank you for that. Uh, um, and um, I, I want to, uh, sorry, Todd, you going to say something? I just was going to, I'm pinning David Parks because he showed up and I had to just call him out. I get to cold call Professor Parks. Hi, hey, everybody. It's really great to be here. Ah, David is here. Oh, my goodness. Dean Parks is no longer David Parks. You must refer to him as Dean Parks. No, 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 no. I wasn't going to miss this. It's great to be here. I'm just Thank hanging you, out. Professor. Pretend I'm not here. I'm just hanging out. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so Kelly had, you know, Kelly typically has, you know, crazy ideas. Uh, and so he's had, you know, uh, 
should we do something with the governor? I go, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do something. And then, then he said, like, can you interview him? I'm like, well, I don't know. Sure. And then uh, we, we kept thinking a lot about this. And then we've been, you know, with DQ being set up, we've been thinking about various ways for us to reach more people and translate what we're finding. And so the team sort of basically said, we should just basically start a podcast series. Um, and what, who better to kick off the first podcast guest than the governor of California? <laughs> and so that's where this all led to. So so what we're going to do is uh, a little bit of interactive stuff. So the full podcast is going to get released next week. You guys are getting a sneak preview of this uh, right now. Uh, the conversation with the governor was about 45 minutes. We're not going to go through the whole all the video for it. We're going to show you a few snippets. And then we'll have a conversation around the snippets and 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 get your uh, get your perspectives. Uh, so with that, I'm going to do what I always used to do with HBAP, which is share my screen. Um, and so I'm going to share my sound. And then uh, we'll start. So the first segment uh, basically lays out the foundation. Kelly looks very official. You'll see he, is he ready to suit or something. I don't know. Uh, and uh, so uh, and this sort of lays the foundation for the conversation that we have with the governor um uh on 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 these things and so uh let's set this up properly and then we'll go and yeah please of course hbap style use a lot of chat a lot of reflection on it as well hi i'm kelly kimball and i'd like to tie kelly you forgot your tie okay i'd like to welcome you to this informative engaging conversation about the transformative power of entrepreneurship and business First, before we get into that, I'd like to thank the governor and the governor's staff for actually hosting us in this beautiful historic mansion in downtown Sacramento, California. I'd also like to thank the folks from D-Cubed for putting this event on and making this thing happen. Many of them have flown all the way over from Boston to, to be here today. And I'd also like to thank the Harvard Business Analytics Program Startup Club. Todd Browse, Susan Schultz, Ashley Wilson, uh, these folks have kept this community alive for a long time, and if it weren't for them, this particular conversation would not have happened. First, I'd like to introduce you to Kareem Lakani. Most of you already know Kareem. For me, I took a class with Kareem about three years ago, a class in digital transformation, and that class actually changed my business. It changed the strategies that I, that I thought about a business. It actually have created new businesses based upon the learnings I had in that class. It was a tremendous opportunity for me to learn from such an incredible educator. It is really my honor to put these two minds together. You guys know Gavin Newsom as governor. You know Gavin Newsom as a political leader. You know Gavin Newsom from seeing him on television, on, on the news stations virtually every night. But you don't know the Gavin Newsom that I know. The Gavin Newsom that I know is an entrepreneur. I recently had an opportunity to, to speak with Gavin about that entrepreneurial journey, and he started with this wonderful conversation about his, his liquor store that he started when he was in college. And it was from that conversation that I approached him and said, you need to tell this story. And so the opportunity we have tonight is to put these two incredible thinkers, not only Gavin Newsom, who's built these incredible businesses, but also Kareem Lakani, who uh, is truly one of the masters of, in the academic world in this subject. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Gavin Newsom and Kareem Lakani. Innovating theories, I'm coming with something new. That's the name of our podcast as well. It's called Inventing the Future. All right. Well, thanks okay. for getting out to the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, I know you folks out there on the East Coast are unfamiliar with things west of the Mississippi. So welcome to the thank other you. half of Thank America. you. No, it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of uh, California, my mother uh, in 1972 went from Pakistan to Stanford for her master's degree. Right. I love that. And she spent 18 months getting her master's degree, went back to Pakistan, and that was her ticket back. back I mean, it's back a here. ticket of our success. You yeah. just summed up yeah. first round draft choices from around the rest of the world. Yeah. No, amazing. Right? People coming yeah. for riches, new beginnings, yeah. entrepreneurial, innovative system yeah. that was developed as a consequence. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And like that, so there's like a personal connection for me, what the state of California did for my mom and yeah. for us, and then. I'm on the East Coast, but you know, no, it's all still good. You guys, you know, we, we start things, you join things. It's all fun. <laughs> no, we started. Okay, maybe. You okay, started. the first public school. All right, you know. Right. Okay, fine. The first here, library. We go. here we go. <laughs> We're just very insecure out here. We're very insecure. Maybe that's just a reflection of some of the national news. That's right. That's not fair to you individually. <laughs> so, so Governor, 
you run the fifth largest economy uh, in the world. Yeah. Or it runs us. Or it runs you, yeah, yeah right? vice versa. But before you became governor, you were mayor, but before that, you were an entrepreneur. Yeah. And so the roots for you are in entrepreneurism yeah. and taking risks and starting yeah. from nothing. Yeah. Do you want to just walk us through? Because, you know, I think, I think people, um, entrepreneurs are celebrated, they're venerated, but they don't know the actual, the, the founding stories and what <laughs> is it that sort of gets you going? Well, I'm only here because of that entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. And it's funny, I mean, even, even as I reflect, as I'm joking about, you know, do I run California? Does it run yeah. me? It, it reminds me of that entrepreneurial journey. You know, life happens to you or life happens for you. Yes. And I think the intentionality of an entrepreneurial mindset yes. um, is not always present in the political context, yes, but, but is obvious to anyone that has had an entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Um, inspiration, desperation, yeah. cause and effect, good days, bad days, yeah. um, and taking accountability, taking responsibility. Yeah. And so you learn that um, in, in, in good ways, unseen ways, on, on days where you don't even realize you're learning that, but there's a grit, there's a muscle that's yeah. developed, yeah. Uh, and there's agency. And yeah. I think that's, to me, the, 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 for me, just when I think back on the entrepreneurial journey, this notion that I'm not a victim, that the future. You're gonna take, you're gonna take control. Yeah, that, I mean, you, you, you manifest the future. Yeah. It's not yeah. something to experience. You the future, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. inside of you, and you gotta yeah. make it happen. And so that, that, to me, came from a lot of trial and error, starting yeah. a small wine store, coming out of college, 13 investors, about 7,500 bucks each. But, and you had to ask them for the money? I, I pleaded, I didn't ask, okay. I demanded, I okay. uh, cajoled, okay. I, I patiently waited. Months and months, and things fell through. And yeah. someone who said they do seven thousand five hundred dollars instead does twenty five hundred dollars. My life's ruined. It's devastation. Right. I'll never get this thing open. Yeah. And so it was a course of almost two years to open the, uh, my first business. So two years to just even get the first wine store. Yeah, program. to get the permits. Neighborhood opposition. Yes. Um, lease negotiations. Yes. How do I avoid paying? Uh, the rent during the yeah. time that I'm trying to get a liquor license, getting the liquor license yes. delayed because of neighborhood opposition, yes. because of comp competitors yes. trying to make sure of they kneecapped me before I got there. Um, investors falling through, um, promises so that, how did was, you, did you, that didn't come did through. Did you deal with that uncertainty at that time? Just, I mean, again, back to passion, action. Yeah. It, 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 back, I said inspiration, desperation, probably two driving forces of life. I really believe that. I was yeah. inspired. Yeah. And then you become desperate to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. And, you know, I, I stopped working the day that I wrote that business plan. Yeah. And I didn't really write that business plan. I went to a friend of mine. I said, yeah. what's a business plan? Yeah. I'm like right out of college. Yes. yes. I'm a guy who doesn't read. Yeah. I have severe dyslexia. I'm okay. a 960 SAT guy. Yeah. There's no Harvard. It wasn't in my <laughs> light, my rear view mirror, certainly out the window. Um, I was going to community college yeah. and then I got a call from uh, two uh, baseball coaches down at Santa Clara University at yes. the end of a cycle saying, we can get you in with a miniature baseball scholarship. The money wasn't important, but we can get you a ticket to a four-year degree. And that was my mindset back then. And, and so I had, I had the one gift that I didn't even realize um, of a mindset where it was all trial and error, when you're not gifted academic. Let me stop here uh, and uh, just come back to us like, Thoughts and reflections, Kelly, first you, and then uh, we'll open up for the rest of us. And you know, the HPAP routine, just raise your hand and reflect on uh, what the governor said, you know, in terms of him as an entrepreneur, two years to get a permit, grit, resilience, asking for money. Uh, thoughts and comments, Kelly? What, what, I mean, you know the story I, yourself. I think, I think if, I were to, if I were to characterize his journey, it's not unlike any journey of any entrepreneur. Um, we, the folks that are in this room, myself and the business that I've started, I mean, those scars, as Dean Maris talks about on those scars that on your back of entrepreneurship is, is evident in virtually everybody I talk to. And the governor's is, is no different. I mean, he literally was running out of money. He was literally going broke. Um, and then he got a, uh, the hit in the head with, a with some regulatory issues that he, he hasn't even gotten to yet in this thing, but, uh, but it, it is a typical entrepreneurial story. And I think that's why we wanted this told. Yeah. Other thoughts from our from folks here on uh, on the call. Uh, what stood out to you? What uh, uh, I mean, just, this is just warm up banter, but just I thought initially too there were some quite interesting things going on. If anybody has any questions, please raise your Zoom hands, and I'll pin you up uh, on the on the dais. Susan. Yeah. So in addition to the grit and perseverance and all that, which I totally agree with, I love the concept of you develop agency, right? You're not born with it. 
<clears throat> you may not have learned it in school, but yeah. being an entrepreneur, you absolutely have to learn agency in order to succeed. I love that that thought. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think this this notion that that like in the end you're responsible and you have to take control regardless of the obstacles that are that are coming that are coming your way. Yeah, Sri, thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you, Professor. My question would be like um, bootstrapping or anything that he, I don't know, if mentioned in the in the interview. And second thing is the preparation of the failure scenarios because nothing is hunky dory going to work first time like happy path. So it'll be interesting to note about, I mean, how uh, as an entrepreneur journey you need to prepare for that scenarios, and maybe I would be keen to know about <clears throat> learnings. Yeah, yeah. So when you watch the full uh, full podcast, there'll be more of that. But I think you know, I I I mean, Sri, what from what you're saying, like for me, is always like I love the Mike Tyson, Mike Mike Tysonism. You know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, uh, and um, uh, and so so th there is this this reality that in entrepreneurship you have a vision, you have a perspective, but then but then making it happen is a ton of work and a ton of failure, and you know, in the rest of the podcast. Uh, uh, you know, he, he goes into the failures he faced and what he had to deal with it. But, but I think I think that's part of like the this gritty journey you you uh, you, you need to you need to take. Leo, um, Professor Frame, good to see you again. Um, I really like the fact that he is so honest and so open. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't know whether it's wearing green shoes or just going to be relaxed in front of um, you know the senator, um, sorry, the governor. Um, but the fact that he goes into his personal challenges with dyslexia, the fact that he says, I didn't know how to you know, read, right? You know, I asked somebody else to help me with a business plan. And to a certain extent, I'm reflecting on you know, how we've launched businesses and you know, what do we do when we invest and how important it is to have a team that you really trust that you work with um, and how uh, lucky we are, members of the HVAP group and you know, staying connected with each other. Uh, where we either come to you know the startups you know this Wednesday and you know uh, show the ideas that each one of us has and get critiqued and get complimented, uh, but I think that's really really important. Um, I don't know maybe if Governor had HBAP uh, group with him, you know he'd be a much much stronger business leader. Maybe not uh, go into politics altogether, uh, but I just want to you know again give a shout to you know, Todd and for running this and for, you know, for you to building the community where we come and help each other and uh, become successful together. Yeah, Leo, I mean, I think, I think this is why this, 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 this endeavor by Todd and Susan and Ashley are, is so important that like you, that you can, you know, travel together as well far. Uh, and I think that, that, that matters uh, uh, a ton. Absolutely. It makes, it makes the journey a lot easier. JG. Thank you, Professor. One thing that really surprised me was that when he said that uh, that he didn't know anything about a business plan, and uh, I'm sorry about the camera, I had the, the phone connected uh, at the same time. But the thing is that uh, he knew where to reach out to find out uh, how to write a business plan. So he had uh, the assets to go to. And now the reason I mentioned that is because nowadays we can use AI to facilitate that very quickly. And you really don't have to have to be an expert in writing a business plan to be able to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. Hold that thought. We'll come back to near the end about, about, about AI. We asked, I asked him later, of course I would, right? About AI and the entrepreneurial journey. So we'll, we'll show a clip of that as well on the way. Darnell. Thank you. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, on behalf of Cohort 18, I can say we miss you very much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a pleasure seeing you again. Uh, one of the things that is I find very intriguing when we talk about entrepreneurship is um, what is the trigger? You know, I always because I've been through this myself when I was trying to start a business and I always wonder what, why then? What exactly happened for you to decide, OK, I'm going to go look for that money now to start this business? Is it a conversation you had with your boss? Is it just something you wanted personally? You know, not everybody is born with that, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit where you say, I just have to work for myself or I have to do something. Some people learn it, right? And there's always a trigger. You know, I haven't gotten that yet. And I'm hoping I see that, you know, when, you know as it continues to speak. 
Yeah, it tends to be, I mean, all the researchers, it tends to be this sort of this, this spark that, that you have, this itch that you can't stop scratching. And then, and then, you know, you come to a decision point like, okay, I'm just going to do it. And I think it comes at different points in time for different people. Uh, some of them have sort of a family endowment, you know, like they, their families were always an entrepreneur. So then it's easier for the rest of us. It does, it does seem like, like there is, there's a, there's a real, there's a real like need to figure it out and to prove yourself that this is a thing. And then, and then also like, we, we know that like the, so for some, it doesn't work out. In fact, most, most small businesses do not work out as, as was in one of the comments. Um, and that's again, part of the thing, like either you're in it for the, the outcome or you're in it for the journey. And then some people just get the journey and just want to keep doing it and finding ways to make that happen. Victor. Yes. Thank you. Great to see you, Kareem and everyone. Uh, along the similar line, the, the five words that stuck out to me were very quick, but very impactful. Uh, that's when I stopped working. And I think he meant to say that's when I stopped working for someone else. Yeah. And, and in that context, I just want to point out that we see that week in, week out in this group uh, as people on the call right now and, and some guest uh, presenters have shared their stories. It's a very consistent uh, uh, notion that, that um, I don't think there's one story we've heard that doesn't have that element to maybe the aha or the breakthrough moment that said, despite my uh, insecurities or my questions or my, in his case, in Gavin's case, lack of uh, 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 superior uh, uh, education as he might've phrased it, um, he still t took that step and had that moment. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Marie. Hi, Professor, it's good to see you. Um, I'm reflecting on the component where he's recognizing like the K-12 K twelve system, which just breaks my heart when we think about, you know, somebody who's then ends up being so successful and, you know, really paving the way, uh, obviously for others as well, feeling as if they didn't belong or feeling as if they didn't have value. And I think that's the other piece is because when they don't engage, um, because they've been kind of turned away or turned off by the K-12 system and they don't engage in our higher education system, we're missing out yeah. on having these opportunities, which what's, what you've created, you know, within HVAP you and, and Professor Parks, it, everybody is welcome. Everybody has an equal voice and an equal opportunity and we learn from each other. So it's, it's something that we, we need to change. Hopefully we can. Well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the, the belief many of us have, you know, and I think David and I share this belief is that, you know, talent is widely distributed, but opportunity is not. And, you know, that, that's been part of also like the HBAP experience that we want to, we want to make Harvard available to many more people than is usually possible. Uh, uh, and so, so I think, I think that's part of like the, 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 like, you know, the, 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 the story going forward for all of us, right? Like, like we, we got lucky one way or the other and, uh, you know, made ourselves where we are, but the, the, like, how do we distribute more opportunity for more people at scale is, is actually the, the cool thing for us to you know, put into place. So we'll do Vivek and then we'll do Wilson and then I'll show you the, the, the next, um, the next next club yeah hi hi everyone i just had a quick comment you know the fact that he has dyslexia richard branson had dyslexia how they're able to acknowledge their personal shortcomings and be able to rise above them i think that by itself is surprising maybe if we had a chance to talk about how did he overcome yeah, full segment of that so we've actually hang on we'll talk about how that became a superpower actually oh, thank you good then wilson yeah, I was, I was just going to add that when a lot of times when we talk about entrepreneurship, we we tend to paint it with a broad brush like it's all the same. But, you know, we there's this whole idea. And even at the university level, we'll sometimes we'll teach it like small business management, but other times we'll teach it like scalable traded sector. You know, we're going to reinvent the world kind of thing, which is uh, uh, which is my favorite. By the way. But. But there's everything else in between. Entrepreneurship is this huge spectrum of different activities. And starting a wine store certainly qualifies, but it might be on the lower scale of that. You know, if we look at that continuum, it's not the next Amazon, but it is, you know, something that he wanted to do, a personal goal that he set and was able to accomplish, which is very cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So look, good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the, the next clip. And the next clip is really about the why, like why, 
was like what was the thing that got him like this is something incredible and passionate and something that I want to pursue as a as a wine merchant so 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 let's let's have a look at this uh and then again um it's about about four minutes and then and again we'll chat about what this means uh for us or what, how, what, how you make sense of it but I, I will say just fast track when I talk about emotion and sort of there was a, a strange experience for me because I had never connected the why at the, a deeper level. Yeah, yeah, I'm a kid. Yeah. I just, yeah. you know, I'm passionate just about this. It's in. exciting. And it's just exciting. Yeah. Uh, doing your own thing's exciting. But there was this other young man who came in and he was like casing the place. And I'm like behind the counter. Anything I can do to help? He's like, oh, I got this. And he's in the champagne section. He's there for like ever. He goes, do you have any of these chilled? I said, I actually do. I've got six or seven. And, you know, this, he's like, okay, I got it. I said, well, if you need any help, I'll let you know. He goes, okay, fine. Hey, which one of these would you recommend? I said, well, um, what are you doing? He goes, well, a special occasion. You wouldn't tell me. Very nervous guy. He's like, okay, all right. I, that one? I'm like, that one, yeah. He said, can you wrap it up? I said, like, yeah, I've got this. Put the little paper on, the little plump jack thing. And he's like, thank you. And I'm because like, you're the employee and you're pretty I'm like the guy. only guy there. So I'm like, so I'm doing rapping, the whole thing. Yeah. Rabbing, doing the whole thing. Put yeah. in a little bag. And he's like, thank you, man. He, he leaves. And uh, about three hours later, he comes back in, and I remember my stomach dropping, like, oh, man, I guess it didn't go out. But he was with someone, and uh, she came in with him, and he goes, walks right up to the counter, and uh, remember, it's like yesterday. I mean, I didn't understand the why. Comes up, and, uh, and uh, he's nervous, says, can I introduce you to someone? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I just went down to the Palace of Fine Arts, which was about 10 blocks away from the wine store. He goes, Champagne. I said it was all right. He goes, it was great. I'm like, oh, thank God. He goes, I want you to meet my fiance. Wow. And he opened the wine, and he, but he wanted me to meet her. Yeah. And I'm like, I remember that. It's just like, it's magic. You're tearing up right now. It wasn't a business. It's not a business. Yeah. It's not a transaction. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. opening a wine store. Yeah. Moments. Yeah. Magical moments. Yeah. Life. Like life. Like you enable that to happen. Yeah, yeah. that was just it, yeah. it, it, a small part in small that couple. Part was, that it was like, it was like, just like gives you the wine. joy. Yeah. Like this is important. Yeah. I'm not just transactional. Totally I mean, this so, and it literally changed everything. In fact, so much so, I did an award. I created a magical moment failure award in the business as it grew. Mm -hmm. I opened that wine store. Two years later, it starts to turn a corner. Open a little restaurant up the block. Mm -hmm. Get those same investors to put. $25,000, uh, <laughs> and I got a few more saying, oh, I was always going to invest in the wine, so I'm like, really, now you're around? And that restaurant somehow became successful, and all of a sudden, now people are looking, what else are you going to do? And this Magical Moment Failure Award became a big deal, because we had about 900 employees at peak, about 23 little businesses, restaurants, hotels. Okay. Uh, today, we have four wineries. Yeah. And, but it became a mindset that it's all about Magical Moment. Mm. And but you're enabling magical moments. Magical moments. It's that's about every wine. interaction is the magic. Yeah. Man. It's like the, it's like that's what we're here for. Yeah. That we're not here. Anyone could. You, you don't go. You don't have to go out to dinner. Yeah. You can do it at home. Yes. I mean, anyone could dial in a yeah. wine. It's not about that. They yeah. come here for you. Yeah. They come here for the experience to yeah. feel it. They, there's an experiential. Yeah. And so sight, sound, the way things look mattered. Yeah. The music matters. Details matter. The things you can't see matter. I remember reading about Michelangelo, and, and it may have been a made-up story, but I loved it. It was like way in the corner, it's dark in the Sistine Chapel, and people are like, you know, it's over. You're like, we're good. No one can even see That's that. Right. And he infamous said, no, God, God can, can see, see that. Yeah. But I don't even know if that was true, yeah. but I love that. Yeah. Like, God can see that. Yeah. You know, and however you do anything, or everything you do, or whatever the old adage, however we do anything is how we do everything. Yes. And I think about that every morning I make my stupid bed. I'm yeah. like, why am I going back? Who cares? No one's even here. And I'm like, okay, I gotta do <laughs> how you do anything is how you do everything. And so just a mindset that came from iteration, trial and error, and an entrepreneurial energy yeah. and spirit. Yeah. Ellie, your reflections first. Yeah, uh, this is why I wanted him to speak. This this story when we heard when I heard this story for the first time heard about the liquor store, um, you know for me I mean I'll make no bones about it. I've known him since he was in uh, San Francisco and as as mayor and my whole world is making him president. So when I heard this when I heard this story it's the first time I've actually heard him get emotional about anything. You know he's very factual he's very quick, 
But this one, he paused and he literally, you know, you saw the, the depth of who he was. And it was at that moment I realized he's one of us, you know, the, this tribe of, of mission driven entrepreneurs. Um, and it is a story that I think needs to get out. But uh, he's absolutely right. If you don't have a why, um, you don't have a reason for even entering this, this, this ring. And it's tough and it's horrible. It's a horrible existence. So unless you've got a passion and a mission, um, you've, uh, you, 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 you might as well go do something else. And, uh, and, and thank God he did, you know, because if it wasn't for that liquor store, you know, you wouldn't be doing this, uh, this, this, this interview with him today. So. Other thoughts, comments on, on the why. Dean. I feel like I'm the, I'm your muse act until somebody raises their hand. Yes, you are. Yeah. yeah you are. Well, I mean, I can completely relate being in the wine family business. He got it and where he got it was he figured out that he is actually making art. He's actually an artist. And if you make the wine, that's what you actually do. And and I think that to me, he actually, you know, that that's a big one. And and he figured that out. He got that why, and that why is actually the art. The art is the the service, the relationship. So I, I picked it up when obviously brought that his fiance in. So and that's what we do did in our business that we sold, our wine that we sold. It, it bring, and he was an artist and it was a successful one. And had to figure it out. So I thought that was awesome. Yes, yeah, so Dean. When you say art, say say more. What is it about the creativity that artists do that you sort of see in, in this as well? Like what 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 are yeah, you? Yeah, the the art of reading what customers are looking for. The art of understanding what the fruit is like, especially if you're making wine. What is the shifts in in flavor? Is it more oaky? Is it you know? Is it has it changed in consumer? And Brent. For, for us, reflecting on us, and and Gavin would have done this in what he puts on the what he puts on the shelf, is what what are they looking for? And the art is 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 what they're wanting to experience. So they take that wine away or whatever liquor it is to have that experience. And and Brent, I know Brent, my brother, who is talks about that all the time. He really does. He has to match the art to the demand of what's out there in the market. And so you need it, and it's never the same. It changes. Great, ugly. Hi, uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment about that it's really amazing how he had all the manifestation and all the, the driven and wanting to figure out things. And later on, he finally found his why. You know, mm. I think that's very, I think it's like very shocking to me because sometimes we try to find the why before we act but if we know that you know we have this this uh desire inside to just keep doing stuff and figure out things and then when that why finally arrives it just makes everything better and now he has a bigger purpose so i thought that was that was really amazing a very good moment that he that he was able to share with us yeah you know i think i think you know it's interesting Mark, as you're saying that you know when you know you know i see a lot of people in their 20s you know at hbs uh and they you know, the advice typically given is, oh, like find your passion. But in your 20s, it's really hard to find your passion. Like, I don't know. I got now in my 50s, I don't know what my passion is, but at that time I had no idea. And the thing that was interesting for me was like this advice uh that you know, go after your curiosity, satisfy your curiosity, and then in that curiosity, you'll find your passion. Some things won't you know, you'll try it and you won't be interested anymore. Other things you'll go deeper into it. And so there's like this this delayed sense of why that can happen. And uh, of course, having a, you're, we're lucky if we can find our why sooner and we can make it happen. But if it doesn't exist, still go and do stuff, right? Make make a difference and then and then and then pull that off. Yeah. Link. Hi, Professor. It's great to see you again. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, I had a question. He mentioned one point in the interview that he said that, you know, you dream big, dream further than things you can even see and, you know, things that you cannot see. Consider all possibilities. And as entrepreneurs, um, we, <laughs> I know my mind thinks of all the possibilities and, and unintended outcomes. So sometimes our business decisions have unintended outcomes that lead to maybe, you know, ethical concerns, especially doing stuff with technology. Um, and especially when that technology is now mixed with people. Is there, you know, as an entrepreneur, you got to put your head down and keep going forward. 
But when is the point, when is the right time to stop and take a look around to say, all right, wait, what unintended consequences might this cause and have it not be a detriment to the business by stopping something that could potentially be great um, and good by the people. But you, as a, as a business decider, you got to make those decisions. When is the proper time or how is the proper time to stop progress if you feel as though it might lead to unintended harms for your business and for people? Yeah, absolutely. Like, really good point. And I think, I think what I would sort of say is that, look, I mean, I think there is a, there's certainly a, the whole notion, the word unintended means it was not intended, right? And that you probably didn't even anticipate it. And so part of the, of the sort of the moral compass of the entrepreneur needs to be sort of awareness of when stuff is going sideways, right? That you can pull the plug, right? You can say, no, this is not the right thing for us to do. Then that takes courage because you have a business, things are going well, but if for whatever reason, your spidey sense is saying, this is not the right thing for us to do, then you need to, you need to pull the plug. And, and certainly like, so I think that's, that's going to be part of like the, the conversation to put yourself under, right? And to hold yourself up to those, ethical standards. These standards vary by person, by culture, and so on and so forth, but you have to be internally consistent with the with the norms of your society, norms of your community, and the norms you're stating out for yourself. Uh, and then you, you, you can make some hard decisions that way as well. All right, uh, Jeremy Langer. Jeremy is a well-known backup singer now too, so uh, you'll hear about that later. What's up, Big Daddy K? How you doing? Good to see you again. Um, Sure, I got to make a joke if I can. Um, so I had two thoughts on this part of the of the conversation. The first that that Kelly obviously talked about, which is how emotional he got when he got feedback from his customer on how he helped satisfy that customer's needs, um, and maybe not even realizing how impactful it was going to be when he did it. And I think what's we talk about this a lot in the startup club is how you take care of your customer and you're starting with that customer first and how you can really glean so much um, value and drive out of understanding who your customer is and being able to help that customer. So I really liked that part of the conversation. Um, but it also reminded for me that you don't have to be the uh, originator of an idea or a business in order to contribute in a meaningful way that you had an impact on the customer, that a lot of people in the startup journey don't really have an idea, but they have a lot of value to add to the startup and can still feel a tremendous amount of value and return on how you made that customer feel because you built on top of somebody else's idea and you were able to architect that idea and implement that idea and execute that idea. And that's just as valuable as being the first person in the organization, being the second, third, fourth, fifth, is uh, is also can be really, really emotionally rewarding in the same way that Governor Newsom articulated there. So yeah. I just want to talk those two things. Yeah, so true, so true. All right, I see a lot of hands. So, so Wilson, I'm going to skip because you already spoke, and I'm going to just keep yeah. getting others uh, the, ch the chance to come in if you don't mind. Uh, Ali. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Kareem. Um, uh, what I wanted to say was that. Uh, you know, what, what struck me about that story is uh, that uh, Governor Newsom uh, seemed to be someone of uh, high resilience, um, especially when um, he was uh, describing how much meaning he got from uh, his interaction with his uh, customers. It seems to me that uh, this is, um, you know, very uh, intrinsic to, you know, grit, uh, this uh, ability to find this meaning in 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 your work, um, even when uh, you're at the very uh, early stages, so uh, that's what I wanted to mention. Perfect. No, I think exactly. I think it's sort of uh, you know we'll get to the grid point even more so when we talk about this, this dyslexia next. But I think that you can see that coming from him. Uh, we'll go to Tanya, then Carol, then Stan, then Joseph, and then Roland will be we'll close out this section. Go go ahead, Tanya. Uh, good to see you, Professor, and everyone else. Um, I actually f uh, picked up on the fact that he really like the emotional connection to uh, the business that for his business to be able to scale mm -hmm. and then broaden his uh, um, 
liquor business to be a the next idea to be a um, restaurant. I thought that was very insightful that he wasn't really, I mean, you can, there's a liquor uh, store almost every corner, I would say, but that differentiator as um, how he would be serving his customers um, and that um, scalability to be able to identify uh, how he can scale that emotional connection with the customer was very um, um, different from yeah. what yeah, exactly. I think, I think, I think, I think, Tanya is, you know, what I'm getting from what you're saying is also like it moves from just being a transaction to it being purpose. And if right. it, purpose, it, it can really then help you do more, right? Then you're like, then there's a different energy driving you forward uh, than just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just making money. Some people are driven by money and that's great. Um, but, but this shows you that you can, in fact, you know, have, once you have a purpose behind you, it can go, it can go a lot further as well. Yeah. Uh, given what he's done. All right. Carol. Thank you. And I just have to say that everyone has had so much uh, positive and good uh, thoughts to contribute. However, what I want to add is that with the magic moments that the governor talked about, and way back when, when I started out uh, on my own in law, I found that what I really uh, gleaned and had my best uh, impetus was with the relationship that or relationships that developed. And it sounds like that's what happened with him. And then from that, um, one, I was able to grow. And then ah, it was mentioned about, oh, when it doesn't work out, how does it work out? It does work out because you're able to find a way to move on. And I think that that's what he did. And it's not a question of it's a failure. It's a question of, ah, it's now time to move on. And I think that all of this has been, you know, what he's expressed has been, ah, in my experience, quite ah, real. So thank you. Yeah, no, I, and I think, I think, I think for me also, like you know, like you, you never know, like you know, like it's a governor <laughs> of a state, like and and he he seemed, you know, as you can see, very genuine and very human in these conversations and and what we're doing, even though he was dissing the East Coast, and you know, I, I put him straight, but uh, but. Um, uh, uh, but I hate the Golden State Warriors, but that's a different story. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just put my Celtics hat on. Just... My daughter lives out there in Fremont, and <laughs> she actually went to Santa Clara when he mentioned Santa Clara. What can yeah. I say? <laughs> anyway, all, and I love going out there. And there is a different, there's a different spirit out there, but there's a great spirit out here. I'm on the East Coast, just with you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nick's, come on, Jamal. You don't want my super fan. I better take my hat off. Otherwise, my, my nasty super fan will come out and I'll start dissing everybody here. Stan, Stan, go ahead. Um, yes, I, I really uh, appreciate a lot of the things that uh, Gavin was saying. And um, Dr. Lacan, you, you bring up a good point when you talk about recognizing the moment or the, the, the eventuality of having to pull the plug on something. Um, and the context of that, especially when it's your baby. Uh, <laughs> that's the hardest thing to do. Uh, something I learned earlier in my career um, and had a person, uh, a mentor just straight up tell me, Stan, this this your baby, you have to let it go because it was dying. Um, the other thing is the context of the timeline of a particular adventure. If it's a long tail project, uh, for instance, uh, I was involved in a four and a half year implementation or rollout of petrochemical plants that were going to implement a new technology. Everything was going great for like four years. All the pieces were coming together. <laughs> and then something happened in the EPA uh, that changed the whole game and the whole four years, four and a half years, just that was it. <laughs> and you, 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 you can, you can wallow and, or you can take what you learned from those four years and move on. And so the question is, after the wine uh, store and into the rail into the restaurant, um, were there setbacks with um, the wineries as he in, in got involved in the wineries? He didn't really get a chance to talk about that. But I would imagine that, as with any entrepreneurial uh, experience, there's the setbacks and how um, 
uh, I forgot who mentioned the resilience um, of of the venture is how important that is because um, like the guy in uh, the Benjamin Button movie that got struck by lightning seven times, um, if if you're familiar with that movie, um, <laughs> getting struck by lightning is a, a function of entrepreneurship <laughs> and yeah. can you keep going? So this is very inspiring. Uh, just this whole uh, cohort experience uh, just in the week of getting things to it is very inspiring. Thanks. Can, a lot. I, can, I, can I interrupt for a second and read you this text I just got from the governor? Let folks know I turned into the I tuned into the last five speakers. Deep respect and gratitude, except for the anti Golden State Warrior shot. <laughs> I tried to chime in, but couldn't figure out. Kids are yelling at me. Need to sign up. So he, he was here for a moment. So <laughs> see, that's like me. Like I don't care. Like <laughs> I'm going to put my C's hat on. I know. Yeah, I asked him if he was if he came back in for a moment. Uh, let me know first so we can actually get him. <laughs> Oh, uh, fabulous, fabulous! So this is this is the power that Kelly has with the governor, right? You can get them to join our to join our uh, Zoom session as well. Uh, Joseph, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's good seeing you again. Uh, um, I would share some experiences, and I because I can get long winded, as some of y'all may know, so I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> but I could tell you from coming from the big four accounting firm. I've learned that there is a hairline fracture between success and failure. Yeah. In the day of the week, even week of the year, any, any month of the year, is a hairline fracture between success and failure. So as an entrepreneur, if we can understand that, that's the reality we all have to face. There's a hairline fracture between success and failure. Also, to put it in golf term, I'm a big golfer. Some days I'm like Tiger Woods. Some days I'm like a tiger lost in the wood trying to find his ball. So I'm going with that is that most golfers will get in trouble as, as that shot that gets you out of trouble. Tiger Woods, all these guys, they get in trouble. That's how do you get out? What's that next move to get out of trouble? Lastly, I will tell you that what I've learned from being a track and field athlete, that the race is not one race that is one in practice. So I would encourage everybody to realize if you put your time in, whether it's an age bag, in business, relationships, the race is not one race that is one in practice. And that's what I got from the governor. And that's been my experience. So you just have to take entrepreneurs. We tend to take the fear out of it because we understand that. And once you can understand that, and you know you got to make that correction shot somewhere, whether it's a basketball game, someone misses a rebound, they try to get it back and correct it. That, to me, what 20 years of being an entrepreneur, being an auditor, is that what is that move you make to get out of trouble? Because it's going to happen to all of us. So yeah. that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. You need to start a course, Joseph. That's that. That sounds good. Yeah. No. That, no. No. Really. I mean, I, I think. I think. I think the the analogy of the hairline fracture is exactly right. I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a lot uh, there's a lot. You know, like I always say, like people get lucky. I'm like, yeah, you always want luck on your side. You never want to turn down luck. Uh, but as you sort of said, it's the practice, right? The practice field is what, where where things where things matter. Uh, and that that can create the distance between the fracture uh, on on which side which side of the fracture you are. Okay, Roland. Well, uh, nice meeting you again, Professor. And uh, first thing I actually noticed, pretty interesting, is it is a very random moment actually the the governor experience which triggers him, and then I think in that moment he discovered like the. I guess there's recognition of the other side as well. And uh, at that moment, he realized he was acting out of their own, his own, and uh, taking the initiative. And uh, people recognize that. And people reconnect to the real world. I think that's that's my reflection on this. Yeah, no, I think, I think, well, I mean, I think, I think the observation, like, you know, that guy showing up at his store. Uh, but, you know, I think what it is also is that it's random in the sense that, you know, random customers come in and out of your stores, but it's the meaning making you make yourself, right? Like as part of like the, the, the why isn't like exogenous, like, like this event happened and, you know, in, in a different store, 
it could have just been okay nice transaction oh thanks for coming by bye like it would not have landed with the person and so mm -hmm. i think the part what, what it is is that that we're always in these random moments it's the meaning making that we do that's gonna that's gonna matter um and so that's the way i would i would i would quote that so look i'm gonna I just want to for the time i've got lots more videos to show so 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 jennifer and madison i'm gonna hang on to you guys just come back in next time and i'm gonna just keep going um so let me get us to the next next clip um actually it's right right here too okay good and then we will keep the conversation going okay now this is where he gets in and talks about his dyslexia okay and how that um uh, factored into his life you know there's a we're in california uh in the tech world you know uh they often say it's a feature not a bug right and you, you mentioned dyslexia yeah right and so for most people this can be like a massive disadvantage right it's a bug right you turned it into a feature my superpower man if, I mean, your superpower? It's, I think it's a super, I, the only reason you're hanging out in Ronald Reagan's old living room. I mean, the hell do I have to do with it? Like, this is, this is Reagan, Nancy Reagan's old mansion. I mean, it's only because of dyslexia. Are you kidding? Yeah. Greatest so, gift so, ever so, happened so, 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 so can, can we just make this into a lesson for people? Like, so again, this, this can be, you know, like, it can, it can stop people in a massive way. I know. And so what, what, what is the lesson here? Like, what, what did you have to channel, right? You, 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 you became creative. You had to, like, build this storm, right? Yeah. And the storm grew, and you built this, yeah. this thing, this, all your businesses. Yeah. But the switch from the bug to the feature, right? Like, how, how did you, like, what's the way in which this happened? And what's the lesson for us? Because all of us have the little bugs, right? That can somehow stop us, that can right. prevent us from, because that in a sense is the entrepreneurial journey. There's, yeah. right? So just say a little bit more about this. This, I think, you know, for me, it goes back even before the, but I think my entrepreneurial journey started when basically kicked out of third grade because I was struggling to read yeah. and was going to speech therapy and the like. And, and people like, he's gotta be tracked in, you know, the back part. That's right, that's right. Like special, it's like, special needs. Yeah, and it's like, it's good. And my mom said something to me, well, I'll never forget or forgive her for. She said, it's okay to be average. I'm like, <laughs> whoa. And I know she did, single mom. You know, she was a teenage yeah. when she had me and no money and the whole thing. And, uh, and she, she just knew, wants the best for you, not for yeah, you to be Yeah, she hurt. said, Could stop beating yourself up. But, she, it was, but I remember that, like, it was one of the great scars, but also the great gifts. Yeah. And I started seeing both and. Scars, gifts, this notion of, you know, this, I don't want to do this setback, come back, all that BS, but it's true. Mm. And, and, and in that created a grit. Mm. Like, man, I'm going to prove you wrong. There's sort of resiliency, this resilient mindset. And I'm, this is not some romantic journey of going from one business to 300 businesses or whatever the hell, I mean, or in my case, 20 businesses, and then ending up in the governor's mansion. Yes. And you too can do that with yeah. these five steps. That's right. Uh, <laughs> is there a book coming out soon? <laughs> but it is mindset. Yeah, it is my the holy thing is mindset yeah. and found meaning purpose mm. that day mm. where that young man came in mm. meaning and purpose at a deeper level. Mm. I never thought about this as a monetary thing. Yeah, I told you I never yeah. worked a day since yeah. I started that once. I haven't worked a day in my passion that I have in yeah. politics and public service. I haven't worked a day since. Yeah. I stopped working the day I, st I left yeah. my good friend Walter Shorenstein's yeah. office at 235 Montgomery Street in downtown San Francisco. That was the last day I worked. And Craig Edwards, who helped me with that lease, is the guy who gave me this gift and freedom. But the gift of dyslexia, of having to think differently. And I don't want to say outside the box because that's rotten overpriced, but a problem-solving mindset. I, couldn't com I can't compete with you to get into Harvard the way other people get it. I can't compete. I couldn't get into Harvard myself. <laughs> I'm just a professor way. there. I don't teach. You're just you know, a I didn't go to school there. It's okay. And, you know, so, you know, don't be ashamed about how bright you are. It's okay. <laughs> no, I'm um, not ashamed. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but there is that mindset. It's like people, certainly, they're wired that way. So I had to find ways to overcompensate. I started realizing, wait, I am more experiential. I am because I'm in the back. I don't, I don't have the confidence to walk up front. I'm not that guy. I don't want people yeah. to see me. I want to feel the room first. And that way, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I feel it. And I feel how he's doing right now behind the camera, this person. And all of a sudden, I can start to absorb that. And then I started realizing I, can, I have a memory that I can remember. I'm like, wow, how the hell did I? 
and you start to overcompensate on that mm. side. So you develop new new things. Yeah, and you don't even and realize it at the time. And then you start, now I'm in politics where I can't read a speech, yeah. but I can read a room. Yes. And how many politicians read speeches, but they can't read a room? Yeah. And they're stuck on stupid because they're reading a speech no one cares about, it's a dud, yeah. but they have to get through it and they're grinding, yeah. but everyone's on their phone. I could shift in a, a dime and go, okay, yeah. obviously I can't, and yeah. now move. Yeah. And that became, a real advantage, but that all came from learning disabilities and entrepreneurs. To me, they're just, they're, I'm not surprised so many dyslexics are entrepreneurs. It makes yeah. so much sense to me. Yeah. I just wish more politicians were dyslexic. <laughs>Yeah, I only have two things to say about this. One is to give credit where credit's due. When we were with the governor, when he decided to speak with us, Divya asked him, it was, what is your superpower? And he came back with dyslexia. And uh, I spoke to him later on that, and that stuck with him. And I think that's where he literally, you know, started focusing this, uh, or framing this part of the conversation was from a conversation he had with Divya. So hats up to Divya who's here. Um, the other is, you know, what I don't think a lot of people realize about this governor is he can't read a speech. So every speech that he gives, he may have on his teleprompter a single word, um, but, but most of it is really, he has it up here. And he's had to create this thing where, where he thinks differently than other people think. And, and it's really hard to debate with this guy, by the way, because you're looking through papers and trying to figure out what the next question, what the next answer is. And he's, a, he's got it all up here. It's all, in the, it's all in the hard drive. And by the way, which uh, Kareem, uh, credit to you. You know, if you notice, Kareem didn't have any, any papers. Kareem didn't have anything prepared. He had a first question prepared. And, uh, and this was really, in my opinion, and uh, just to embarrass him, this was a master class in how to conduct this sort of interview. Um, and I, and I, I would like to say I taught him everything he knew, um, but we'll just go with that. Yeah. He coached me a lot before the meeting. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, that was it. I got your coffee, for God's sake. That was it. <laughs> you did, yes. <laughs> coffee coffee's important. Uh, so uh, thoughts, thoughts on the, the governor's comments on dyslexia, superpower, Divya? You got cold called. I did. Um, yeah, uh, I do have to say, it, he, he did not hesitate for a second when I asked him that, right? Like straight up, it was dyslexia. And it's, I think it was also a very humbling moment at that point where he actually got very vulnerable, like he did on the video, right? Where he just said, what was my weakness is my superpower. I turned it around. And that just makes you so relatable to somebody who you kind of look up to, but you understand where they come from, that they've gone through the struggles to get to where they are and nobody's path is straightforward or easy. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. BT. Uh, first of all, thanks, Dr. Lakhani, Kelly uh, and Todd for this wonderful session. I have not seen this many edge maps from 2022, so that's really good. Uh, I don't have actually comment. Uh, the the all the comments are pretty much kind of like a a class in itself. So I'm probably gonna earn three credits in one hour. Uh, but I do have one thing which I observed whenever Dr. Lakani was asking a governor question, he was following a very particular trait which we have seen in many movie makers, uh, just Joseph Com Campbell's three act. He always is you. Uh, he is always trying to kind of like give you the story in such a manner that you are kind of like glued to the screen. Uh, with his dyslexia and having this powerful capability, it's something actually really need to we need to learn. Uh, I'm actually interested if when the podcast is gonna come, if Dr. Lakhani has asked him about the Gen AI and all, all its implication, compliance ethics, and all those kind of things. But that's a wonderful, wonderful interview. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one more uh, segment on that for sure. Yes. Uh, let's get uh, Jennifer. Jennifer Hung. So much. Uh, good evening, Professor, and thank you so much, Kelly and uh, Todd, for making us all together here. So I just wanted to uh, like make a very short comment. Is that I think the superpower of him actually is like the input of the ingredients of a passion and his high energy and his entrepreneurial mindset and creativity and becomes the output of an infectiously exciting magical moment. 
of his business and the success. Totally. Thank you. Totally. Madison. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Nice to meet you and thanks. To, uh, nice to meet everybody here. Um, as he was talking about uh, his superpower, I, was, I got thinking about, you know, what, what could be my superpower in that sense, you know. And uh, one of the things that was just coming to mind is a statement that somebody made. But I, I thought that was now it's making more sense to me, you know, I mean, probably more than a decade now. Uh, and this person simply said, you know, we have done, I have done so much with so little for so long that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. And I was thinking about how that sometimes we look at many things to be our disadvantage, many things to be the thing that makes us not to be who we are supposed to be. And that is the very thing that is supposed to really contribute to making us the great person that we are supposed to be. So I was just kind of thinking through those thoughts and saying that we, you know, we can definitely uh, make much of what we consider to be a disadvantage that is uh, truly a blessing in disguise. So those were just my thoughts. Yeah, I'm, I'm always, a, always a big believer in turning bugs into features. Like how does it become a feature? What do you need to do to make that happen? Gordon. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, my comments are disability is actually a different ability, right? Change the rules of this game and change the outcome. So what I saw was look at the incredible body language, how he looked at the camera, how he looked at you, how he used his hand gesture to drive that conversation. And that is a sign of, you know, entrepreneurship is that you win the investor, you win the crowd, you continue to win, win that funding. So that, that was impressive. And having this meeting, Kareem, allows us to all think about some people have one baby they carry to the finish line. Others keep on having more babies, which are great fire starters. That, all that's... of these things are essences in how to learn the game, right? The game of entrepreneurship. Wow. So this is really wonderful. Babies do you have right now, Gordon? Huh? <laughs> yeah. How many babies do you have? Oh, how many babies I got? Um, physical ones, I got two in the back, but um, but I've had... I've had multiple babies. I think some people have followed the JLL interview. I played it right all the way up on the interest rate rise, higher for longer. And if you don't control material costs, as a landlord, you're in trouble. So this went national. And one of the keys is when you hit a certain pinnacle, you don't go back down and interview with lower tier things. You just stay at the top. You saw what I did with the HBS award. And you know you play it, you, you throw things at the wall and you see what sticks, and then you just ride with it, right? You know, so so yeah, you have all kinds of different babies. Every baby was different. Every one was different. It's just as hard with the first one as your last one. You just have to keep taking up skills. It's like martial arts: is can you weaponize anything and then choose not to use it to hurt people and do it for impact instead of the money? All these life lessons of developing the why and then eventually developing the why not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this is great. I enjoyed this. Don. Go ahead, Don. Sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Hey, I just wanted to speak to what he uh, spoke about um, the superpower of reading a room. And I think if you break that down, it's really about listening skills and observational skills. And I think those are really critical for entrepreneurs because they are looking for something to fill something that probably isn't already there. And it's the people that are listening, but in their mind, they're already thinking of how they're going to respond um, that, that miss out. I, but I think all of us could improve on that ability to read a room and kind of leverage that superpower. Yeah, yeah, totally. Hi, thanks so much for this. It's It's been incredible so far, but this part for me, honestly, um, just hit in such a personal way um, because of the clients that I work with. I'm a psychologist. And so I work with students all the time who are neurodivergent in a community where neurodivergence is just seen as something that needs to be put aside and not dealt with and looked down on. So to hear this, for me is just 
so inspiring and just feels like I have additional ammunition to give parents and students in this context in which I'm working um, just a hope that um, that their features can be used for something incredible in their lives as opposed to being something that they have to be ashamed of and have to put aside. So on a very personal level, this part of the podcast so far has just been absolutely phenomenal. So thank you so much, Dr. Kareem, for yeah, for I guess ushering the conversation in that way and getting that out of the governor because it's just yeah, it's made my day. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think I think if anything's gonna go viral, it's gonna be that piece. I think I think that that's 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 him truly. And um, yeah, thank you. I knew. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Kelly. Um, the the superpower that he mentioned, which I'm again going to reiterate, basically many of you have said, is that something. Um, I think it's more than just listening. It's listening, uh, if, whether it's business, whether it is um, entrepreneurs, they need to listen to their customers to see, if, you know, are they solving their problem? Are they uh, giving them a solution? So it's, uh, it's uh, you could be listening, but in order to come to the conclusion, it's something more than that. So is that something uh, that we can learn or is it you either have it or you don't have it? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question. You know, my sense is that th these are all learned behaviors and learned skills. These are all skills. Entrepreneuring is a skill. It's not you're something born into. Somebody has to tell you and coach you that you need to listen better, right? And to have mentors that say you're not listening, you know, and and then once you either get that advice, uh, you, you get it, or you acquire that advice or skill in in many ways, then as 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 um, Stan has said earlier, like, you know, that, then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, we have, we have to be able to practice it as well and, and put it into use. So th these are all, all important, all important parts that I think my, my belief is can be, can be learned. Uh, next up, uh, Brian, I'll never forget Brian because uh, people won't believe me when I say this, but I'm like a real introvert and uh, you know, uh, yeah, no, you guys are like, whatever, but it's true. And uh uh, Brian was in the first cohort. I remember the first dinner we had and the first immersion. We were at the Harvard Faculty Club. Uh, at the time, the cohorts were very small. Brian sat beside me and we were chatting about the program and so forth. And I just talked to Brian the whole night because I don't want to talk to anybody else because I'm an introvert. And so, <laughs> so and, but, uh, but Brian's been on an entrepreneurial journey as well. So, Brian. Yeah, that was a fun night. Um, Ben Dooley sat on the other side of you and uh, we're all going to be there on May 7th. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, there was a, a word that he used and it was grit. And he mentioned that his condition, his, his neurodiversity contributed to him being able to develop grit. And on my journey, on my entrepreneurial journey, that was something that, um, we look for in each other, the co-founders, but also the people that we brought into the team. Uh, Cause you have your ups and downs and, you know, reflecting back on how we developed grit, it was really putting yourself into severely uncomfortable situations and persevering through them. And I, I do think that's a, a, a learned skill. That's not necessarily something you have to be born with. It, it can absolutely be learned and it's a prereq. Uh, developing grit is something that I think is a real differentiator. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And again, it's a it's a learned skill. It's a mentored in skill. Um, uh, I mean, there's a book on grit uh, that that Sally Duckworth wrote as well. Uh, there's a mindset book by Carol Dweck that's also very good. You know, really good good ways to sort of think about that. Shelley. Hi, Dr. Kareem. Um or Dr. Lakani, which way were you like? Um, inspiring. <laughs> I had no idea the, the conversation today is going to be actually so spiritual. I, um, entrepreneurship and spirituality crossing paths here. This is, this is very, very, um, interesting and actually a gift. And um, I want to I wanna thank you and thank you, the folks who have put it together for people like myself who just barely join and just listening to all the talks and um, coming here. 
And so many things are striking. And um, I'm, I'm losing the word, so it will come to me. But the only thing I wanted to say at this point with all the learning, with all the sharing is a scar is a gift. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll at least walk away with that if, if many other things that may or may not stick is, is uh, the way the paradigm he said that his mom, uh, you know, he will, it, I think Todd, you mentioned on the chat, I will never forget and I'll never forgive. So that's like the same thing being used in two different ways. It's just um, giving goosebumps. So thank you. Yeah, and I think say is like I mean I think that like being told to be average. I mean you you know what a what a like you could see what a nerve even now from his from third grade to him as a you know uh, as a fifty year old man like what what that what that meant to him. Uh, that that's a scar that's uh, that's always going to be with him. But I want to I want to turn it back to this other thing that Steve Wolby mentioned as well, which is like. Like, how do we teach resilience? How do we, how do we, like, we, we have, you know, random sets of gifts and random sets of features and bugs that, that, that we get. Some of us have, are more lucky or less lucky as we get them. Uh, and I think the real, the real question is, what do you do with them? And there's a real sense of like, what you can see in him is a transformation that he went through himself, that this is what I got. And then I'm just going to make the most of it and make it work. And I think that's part of the, the, you know, the journey that many of us uh, are faced with, and uh, you know, can can potentially be transformative if you take it as that instead of uh, sort of being in woe about it. And 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 th this is where the agency uh, matters, like the agency of the entrepreneur uh, matters. All right. Uh, so I'm going to get uh, Zandra, Barbara, Erica. And if you have time, I get to Stan and Ali. I just want to get the folks that haven't spoken yet uh, some chances. Zandra, go ahead, please. Thank you. And like everyone has already iterated, I want to, it's great to see you and to be part of this community among such brilliant minds. Um, I guess I wanted to state that, you know, being part of the startup conversation how much of us are reflecting on the spark that got us here in the first place? <clears throat> Excuse me. The governor said, like Shelley also said, you know, it was the words of his mother. It's okay to be average. And I'm just wondering if we have all reflected on that as our spark. Maybe it may have not have been those literal words, but what has exactly sparked us to get to a Harvard startup conversation with such brilliant minds. And like uh, Professor Kareem said, you know, how do we embrace that? How do we embrace that spark that we may have received along the way? And how do we, how do we teach that spark to other people? So yeah. with AI, we get to a point, you know, people are, we'll get to that, I guess, in the conversation, but people are so scared about losing their their jobs and these machine learning devices are taking over the world. Well, how do we teach and embrace that that spark is what differentiates you from any machine learning capability? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's going to be part of, I think, what we, um, what we have to figure out. Barbara. Barbara, I can't hear you. Maybe pop it back in again. I'll go to Erica and then Ivan, uh, maybe you can uh, fix it. Erica. Awesome. Thank you, Kareem. I appreciate that. Um, so your question about like, how do you teach resiliency or how do you help others to understand resiliency? What I really liked about Governor Newsom is that he holds a place of power, but he's very confident in himself enough to talk about his weaknesses. And so 
I feel like the more that about their weaknesses, that will inspire others to uh, learn from those resilient actions and to be able to then be more open about that. I think we live in a culture where everyone is like, oh, we don't want to talk about failure. We don't want to talk about like our weaknesses or like our deepest insecurities, but that vulnerability is actually what helps him connect with people. And that also shows the confidence that um, other leaders I haven't seen really possess or all of some leaders have not possessed. So I I feel like if people can start talking about their weaknesses and being vulnerable, that will help others to learn from um, those experiences because he's such a beacon of hope to so many people, like so many people that have disabilities or so many uh, even like immigrants that come to a new country, they feel like they have a disadvantage, but really they can turn that into their greatest strength by seeing examples of others. Um, the other piece that I really wanted to touch on was uh, St. Christensen always said that people want to buy experiences. They don't want to buy things. And so the fact that he was, he, he, got that inspiration of like oh I'm going to be selling experiences and that translated not in just to a like a wine shop but restaurants and then it continued to drive success with his other companies because he was selling experiences not just like a bottle of wine and then I think how we can apply that to AI tools that we're building right we're selling experiences no one wants to just buy an AI tool or purchase a SaaS product. They want to purchase an experience that makes life better for them. And so that was a really powerful moment to see him talk about selling experiences rather than just products. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, and again, I think, I think, I think you sort of see, you know, like, like, his journey, his whole journey feeds him to where he's at right now, which I think is, is quite, quite special. All right, Barbara, let's, should we try again? Did we fix it? Yes, we did. Ah, good evening. Thank you, everyone. I was going to say, Professor, you're doing an amazing job. And Kelly, what a great job setting this up. And Todd, getting 160 plus people on board. Way to go. So thanks, group. Thanks, everyone. You know, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, the governor and his sister were, you know, he, he and, and the governor alluded to this in his conversation with you, Professor, you know, he was, his mom was single, right? And like, this is a woman that was born in the late 40s. She passed away of, of breast cancer and was working in his business, I believe, before he even ever became governor. And she worked all through her illness. So, you know, and I'm glad Shelly brought that up about actually the intersection of like, you know, entrepreneurship and this spirituality that he talks about. You see that he has that in him. No matter what, like obviously the comment that his mom had made to me, I, I mean, I got it. She didn't mean it in a in a belittling way, but obviously it was motivating to him, right? Because he worked with her to the end and he saw what she lived through to the end. And I think that having that, I mean, motivated him, obviously. I mean, the woman worked through her disease. She worked, you know, till the very end. And I think that has stayed with him. And you can see that. I don't necessarily agree with the man on many of his political issues, but I definitely um, take heart to the journey and the fight that he's had and his authenticity. I mean, you've got to give the guy that. And so um, I definitely was impressed with his honesty um, not just with how he got to where he is, but what he overcame to do so. But it's really clear that his mom's influence is not one to be taken lightly. But that woman was definitely, everything I've read about her, uh, she, if anything, she was definitely, um, from what I understand, she was nobody to mess with. That woman fought to the very end and I think um, was definitely a role model both for him and for for her. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And and you know what I mean? I think I think uh the 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 single family nature of his of his upbringing and him trying to figure it out all by himself, right? And 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 trying to be ambitious along the way is is part of the of the story here as well. All right, Ivan. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. So first of all, KPK, also known as uh, Kelly Patrick uh, 
Uh, Kimball, thank you for putting this together. Professor Karim, nice seeing you again, as well as Todd. Thank you for, for assembling this. Um, as I was, you know, reflecting on, on the video, when I heard him talk about the Regan room, right, that uh, he was at where Regan used to uh, hang out, it reminded me a lot of my dad. One of the proudest moments of my dad, he was an entrepreneur back in Los Angeles, um, was the, when, it's when he got his uh, electrician uh, license and it was signed by Ronald Reagan, no, no other than Ronald Reagan in 1970, whatever, 172, right when I was born. So um, the, the other thing I draw from, from this is uh, the parallels of being part of a private equity deal. I've been part of a couple of them. Um, I've been thankfully and, and gladfully advised also uh, in, in this journey by, by Kelly. Um, and, and I can see a lot of parallels of an entrepreneur with a PE guy, right? Uh, that, that you're looking for that EBITDA, uh, sleepless nights, trying to figure out how to how to exert value and change things uh, in a way that customers appreciate it. Um, I like the piece that he talked about reading in a room and the moment that you figure out, ah, this is what I like. I've sat with a bunch of customers throughout my my last couple of years and throughout my career, but I I, I really like, I, I feel that doing what I do, even though I put tons of hours and I'm away from, from my family, uh, it pays off when you start seeing that change and hearing customers that they're happy uh, about what's happening in the company, the changes that they see. So that's what I capture there. And then last but not least, I'll tell you about my superpower. And I'm looking at Magali right now because she's going to appreciate this one. Because uh, we have a saying and also uh, amongst us uh, Mexicans, uh, and that is that my superpower is that I'm Mexican. And that means that there's grit, there's resilience, uh, there's family values. Um, this this superpower of mine is so great that I wasn't even born in Mexico. I was born in Los Angeles. But there's a saying out there that says that Mexicans, we born, we're born wherever the hell we want. So <laughs> I want to share. Thank you very much. And let's keep enjoying this uh, this conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I mean, and that's why I mean, you know, I'm I'm not sure if it's still continuing on at the in the intros in the uh, the first course, but I always wanted to the start. Remember, like it's always panicky when I when we do our intros in our court in the first course, and we say like, "What's your superpower?" Uh, as a way to sort of uh, you know sort of make that make that happen. Okay, so I'm going to go to Jamal, and then uh, then we'll wrap it up, and then I. You know, I've been I've been texting with Kelly in the background. I, we've got all this AI stuff, but I think you'll have to wait and watch the full podcast uh, to get all the all the AI magic that we talked about. I, and by the way, just my my, uh, um, I thought I thought you know again you you have a a bias view of politicians, so I, I didn't expect him to be as knowledgeable as he was on the AI stories, uh, and he was quite uh, it was quite good. So I think the podcast gets released. Uh, I think next week, uh, and then you know you should watch it many times, share it with your friends, get other people to subscribe to it, and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay, Jamal, are you still at Netflix, Jamal? Uh, yes, yeah, still at Netflix. I actually, just changed teams. My manager is going to be speaking on uh, May seventh, actually. Oh, okay, on experimentation. Okay, awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. Some experimentation now. Uh, data science and engineering. So made that change, and uh, yes, yeah, looking forward to being there and uh, seeing my manager on the big stage and on the panel. Um, so what I wanted to do is just speak a little bit on uh, my thoughts on whether resiliency can be can be taught or not. Um, I don't think it's something you can teach. I think it's something you learn, you experience it, right? It's like really just going through the hard times, not quitting, not giving up, and just like wanting to see things through um, to be successful. Like for me personally, I'm like, I, didn't have it until I started playing sports as a kid. I played like football and baseball, a little bit of basketball, but football was my sport. And it was always tough to get through a season because it was painful. Like uh, I enjoyed the sport, but it was like a tax to pay for it, right? But that kind of carried with me through my college career, like my current career now, like working in finance and switching into software engineering and doing FinTech and now working at a big tech company like Netflix, being in platform engineering, now I'm in data science and engineering. Like just being able to like not give up, keep your eyes on the goal and like go for it. From edu from an education standpoint, I think that if you're looking to try to- Before you go there, I just want to 
reflect on what you said, which is like it has to be experienced. But I think I, what I would argue with you hmm. is that the learning is like you you still had coaches and you had peers who pushed you along. It wasn't just you yourself. Yeah. And so the 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 teaching is in that in that moment when you have folks that sort of say, you know, do that extra lap, you know, do that drill one more time, right? And 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 being motivated by people around you. So part of resiliency is that you have to experience it, but it has to be demonstrated to you. It has to be around you. It has to be in the ether, and it, and you need some mentor to ask the tough question, some mentor to to question like. Are you working hard enough? You know that that kind, those kinds of things, and I think so. That's that's the way. That's what I mean. Like it can be taught in that way. Like it's not like a, you know, like I'm gonna get write a PowerPoint yeah. on resiliency, and then you're all gonna become resilient. It's it's really this 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 teachable moments that happen on the field, in, in the workplace, in 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 whatever situation you're on, um, uh, that that makes this happen. Yeah. And the very last thing I was going to add is that like, it's really just showing those examples of folks who were resilient. So when you can recognize the time when you need to exhibit that, you can draw back to those examples and really internalize it and then see it through. Yeah. And I have one last question, if I may. Yes. I wanted to know, like, where did you get that hoodie? Wu-Tang forever. Like, I need to get one for myself. You, you, you got that, right? Yeah. Just all I, of course. <laughs> Some retargeting on Instagram, the algorithm did it. Uh, now I'm like a massive hip hop um uh, hoodie collection, so it's it's kind of fun. <laughs> gotcha, fair enough. Two thumbs up on the hoodie. <laughs> Thanks. So, guys, we're at time. There's three minutes left. Um, I'm just gonna cold call um, uh, 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 um, uh, Kelly to wrap it up. <laughs> I was gonna cold call you for a change. Um, yeah, look, uh, this was a unique opportunity, I think, and to to really understand. Uh, of, of a part of somebody that we don't really get to see very often and he doesn't really open up like this. So I encourage everybody to actually read the, or listen to the entire podcast. Um, and then uh, uh, before I finish with a question back to the professor, um, the, uh, you know, you guys are getting an experience of what this HBAP community is. I th and I think uh, uh, those professors that are on here uh, will agree that it's this a really unique community within HBS. And every single Wednesday we meet like this. Not only this, there's other programming as well that we're doing through Dcubed and uh, uh, and also uh, 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 through the HBAP community. Um, and I encourage you guys to come every week because it's going to be different every week. It's unique every week. We've got everything from actors to athletes to 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 professors uh, to authors to you know. It's really a, a really wonderful place where we can uh, kind of kind of hang out and be together. Uh, and my and I'll and I'll finish it up by by a cold call to 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 Kareem. A question to Kareem. This was your first politician, yeah? yeah. Um, what, are you, what did you, th you know, you have these preconceived notions, obviously, for somebody who's a, such a public figure. Um, what, what were you struck by that, you, that, that surprised you, I guess, is the question. Well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, there's a I, I won't answer that question. I'll answer a different question, which is uh, I've had a bunch of sort of, meta learnings in this past year for myself um and uh which has sort of really made me cherish even more a belief i've had about being like a very radical bayesianist and what i mean by that is that you know i often tell my teams like i have strong views but they're weakly held uh and what that means is that in the in the in the in the light of new information, you should always be updating your priors. You should always be be rethinking things and 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 coming to new new judgments and new new perspectives. One of the, one of the things I value the most in a case teaching classroom is when I ask the question like, "Who changed their mind?" and tell me why, because I want to actually understand that process because it's those that have changed their mind on a decision in the case and so forth that we can learn more about like the insight. That drove it. So, <clears throat> of course, politicians, you know, you, you sort of see them as plasticky and sort of out there doing what they're doing. Um, but this was a this was a real human being, uh, and he wasn't putting on a show. He, we were having a conversation. It was a really genuine conversation. And as you as you go through the whole thing, <clears throat> you, you'll sort of see you'll see the his humanity come out. 
And same thing like with me, you know, I had a very different perspective of the justice system, but then I got to spend three months in, in a Middlesex County grand jury um, last, you know, in fact, a year ago. Um, and uh, um, and that that made me really rethink the role of police and DAs and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so one of the things that, that, you know, Kelly, that I would sort of say that is what resounded for me is like the, the value in being a Bayesianist and like not getting stuck to your opinions, not not being rigid in your views, but being flexible. Um, so anyway, that's what I would sort of say. Well, thank you for coming. You're welcome here every Wednesday. I'm sure you'll make that a point from this point on. And uh... oh, well, yes. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I have one more thing, which is, um, you know, one of the things I remember again in the early days of HBAP, you know, people would sort of say like, like, well, why isn't the program doing X? Why isn't the program doing Y? Why isn't the program doing Z? And I'm like, because we can only do so much, but we built a platform and you guys should build the components on top of the platform. Uh, and I'm so glad, you know, that Ashley and, and Susan and Todd took this to heart and, and, and made a, a very important piece of the, of the platform where we don't need, you know, the Harvard or HVAP or whoever to give you permission. You can just go do it and make it happen. And, you know, Todd did that before also, of course, with overtime, uh, and so forth. Um, and so, so I would just say that again, like, this community really is a platform. It's very unique uh, in the world, if anything. Uh, and um, I hope you guys keep continuing to engage with, the, with each other and keep learning. You know, Anthony is here too. Anthony's always here. So uh, we have a long, long Thank day. You. Thank uh, you. I, I don't have the word the the logo as well uh, for the program. So. <laughs> Well, you've got a plane to catch, so we'll, we'll we'll catch up with you later. But to everybody else, we're going to stick around for we'll stop recording and have an overtime. Yeah, Todd. Yeah, absolutely, Kareem. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording now, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>